Well, guys, we are back for another episode of the Liberal Asshole Show, episode 23, and we got eight topics to talk about. So, what are today's topics? Uh, wet light bulb, the Allies' treaties in World War One, especially what happened to the Ottoman Empire, ripping apart Rokana, context of slur usage, bad acceptance, Mike's leftist in fighting video, states banning gaming PCs, and a really dumb BuzzFeed video. All right, so what do you want to talk about this time to start off first? Okay, what's wet light bulb? Okay, so, of course, this involves climate change-related issues. So, the wet light bulb, I mean, wet light bulb is, remember when you when your body gets hot, it releases sweat to cool you down? But if yes. the But if the environment around you is, I think it was like it had to be at least 95 degrees or more, plus high humidity, too? Your body can't cool down, so you'll die from overheating because your body can't naturally cool down. And be and that's why a lot of places become more <laughs> uninhabitable because of climate change, make it too hot and place, a lot of places, too, get more wetter as well. So because of that, people have and to... Then there are, and then there are those places across the world where you're going to get 10 months of no rain at all, and then you're, you're literally going to spend 10 months baking to death because there's no water, dying of thirst, and then you're going to be underwater for the remaining two months. Yeah, and of course, this is going to get worse and worse as climate change gets worse. And of course, yep. there are maybe some solutions about it, but this is pretty concerning. Thankfully, there is one simple way to fix this, and that's going like inside an air-conditioned building. But there's a couple problems with that. Not everyone can just do that like people probably they're playing jobs that require still working outside and they can't cool down pretty much that way and of course not everywhere has air conditions and another problem too with air conditions did you know that um air conditions and refrigerators use a um a coolant whatever coolant they use that actually is more potent greenhouse gas than what we're doing right now i've heard of that um so it's also a, like a very small amount with it and it um proportion though it's um thing it also breaks down really quickly I and mean, at least it's a bit better than when they used to stuff they had used to destroy the ozone layer yeah they, they actually did remove some versions of that f previously with air conditioners and refrigerants but unfortunately one is Still producing more, so maybe they might have to change that in the future. But I also found something really concerned. Guess how much um, um, energy usage worldwide is from air conditioning alone? How much? 20%. Just, you could probably say, what I'd say, like 1% of, of it's just Australia in summertime. <laughs> <laughs> or across not all, exactly, it is going to get very hot here. Or, of course, across all of America pretty much, too. But you know that's going to get worse. Heat dome. Yeah, but you know it's that's going to. I believe in places like on the west coast, if I remember correctly, it's still there even now. Because um, that's going to get a um, more. Ex that's going to become more as the years go on, and uh, that's going to be a little bit of a problem, especially with the um effects that we just talked about the coal and stuff that they have yeah. in them. So yeah. only thing I could say is really, what were you saying? Yep, yeah, got to do something. Like at this point, uh, we got to get to net zero yep. for as quickly as we can, and we've got to figure out a way to even scrub some carbon dioxide yeah, out of the atmosphere. There, there actually is some. There are actually um stuff in that can actually do that. They're actually trying to do that in California right now, but that's probably going to be a lot of work to do. And then of course it has to be temporary because you can't suck out all this, like, the carbon in the atmosphere because we need it to keep warm to prevent, like, right. global cooling. So no, gotta... you could, like... Yeah, we do, like, it was 280 parts per million... Before the Industrial Revolution, it's uh, down to 410. Yep, the, the Industrial Revolution, and now it's 400, uh, a little over 420. That's I heard. Well, that is 50% to the carbon dioxide level in two centuries. Yeah. Yeah, we got a lot of work to do on that. Maybe we should do a op topic one time about ops, you know, things we could do to combat climate change. Yeah. And that's one thing you all yep. got to worry about, too. When it's, like, that hot outside where you can't cool down, if you can, go inside a building with air conditioning, drink water, 
hopefully you're able to do that wherever you are when it's hot. All right, so what do you want to talk about next? The trainees in World War uh, One. Oh boy, Rem- I think it was last episode or two episode two episodes ago. Remember we talked about the hypocrisy of how Japan was treated after World War Two. Yeah. This is another thing that bugged me too, and that's how the Allies handled the Central Powers, and of course, honestly, in a lot of ways, caused World War Two because of it. Oh my God! Well, it didn't help. It, it didn't help. Yeah, that's for damn sure. There was four main people in the Central Powers. Bulgaria, I don't think, really had much of a problem with it in terms of what happened to them. But, oh, God, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Oh, boy. The Ottoman Empire was by far the biggest, the worst one. That Um, was the absolute worst. The Austria-Hungary one, okay. For me personally, they were the ones who started the war. Um, Austria-Hungary, they started World War I. Yeah. Um, so they're the ones that should be, have been hit the hardest. Um, even that still seems somewhat of an overkill too, though. The entire empire completely torn apart and they weren't even like completely occupied either. Austria, Hungary was start, was falling apart even yeah. before world war one. Um, all that world war two did was cement their collapse. They were already gone pretty much by the time after world war one. But yeah, that, that honestly might have been a little bit overkill. But hey, at least they broke them up into like separate countries based upon demographics, which is nice. Yeah. Although, that still seemed really overkill too, what they did to hu- the Hungary side of the empire. They cut down by like 60 plus percent of their territory. And the funny thing yeah. was, they were the ones that didn't even want to get involved in the war, remember? Um, Hungary, well, the thing is, um, one of the other countries, like had they been let go... To keep doing what they were doing, there wouldn't have been a Hungary by about twenty, by about nineteen twenty. They were literally, they were literally, when one of the treaties came in, they were literally at the door of Budapest. And then, um, and then of course another thing happened with the Austrian Austrian Hungarian treaty was what happened with Italy, because remember they were supposed to get a whole bunch of Austria-Hungarians land, and they ended up didn't because a lot of it went to Yugoslavia? Oh, yeah. And that was a big honestly, reason. Honestly, I, like, okay, in a way, um, I would have actually, in a way, gone harder and softer as well. Um, I would have actually had, like, an international thing occupy Austria and Hungary for a little while, uh, for a while after World War One. And be like, you guys don't like, you guys occupied all these other guys. Let's see how you guys like being occupied for a while. Because that was a big part of the reason why Mussolini took power too. Because Italy didn't think they won enough that they should have. Yeah. So that, that part pause too. Especially since also Mussolini was also the inspiration too for Hitler's rise somewhat as well. So that's definitely not a good start. And we're not even into probably the worst aspects too. So then, let's get to the Ottoman Empire. Oh God, this one dis- honestly disgusts me the most. They were- it, this one, this one, we're still feeling the effects of today. Yeah. So if- we're still how is the rick ripples of what they did to the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War One is still being felt today. Yep, because there's a multiple multiple reasons for that. First off was the Sykes Pigot me Plague Picot Agreement. Which originally, the Ottoman Empire pretty much controlled, like, the Arabian Peninsula, and they wanted freedom. So, the British encouraged the Arab Revolt, and if they successfully revolted from the Ottomans, they were supposed to have, like, almost, not only almost all the Arabian Peninsula, but it was supposed to go, like, all the way up to, like, Iraq and Syria, pretty much. But, of course, the British and French decided to be colonizers, as they always were, so they actually were l- lied to them, and they were going to take, like, Iraq and Syria and all them as, like, their protectorates and their colonies. So, that was a big fuck-up, too. Which, by the way, is the effects we're still dealing with this day, like Vlog just talked about. And it was not just that, too. They were going to literally partition the Ottoman Empire, like, tur- like modern uh, Anatolia yes. Turkey. So gonna give, yeah, literally, I think, like, at most, there was going to be, like, this small section around Ataturk. And they might not... And, they, and um, though, I'm going to be honest, uh... <laughs> If that actually gone all the way and completely partitioned, I think the um, Soviet Union would have had something to say, or something to say or do about it. Yeah, they. Pr- and, um, they- and Greece actually tried. Greece actually tried to do that. 
after World War One. Yeah, they were gonna um, partition like all, almost all the Im Ottoman Empire and leave in Turkey with just like a rump state, like right in the middle of Anatolia. Like unbelievably ridiculous. And which the then um, Greece would have then um, invaded and taken. And then the um, Ottomans, unlike all the other powers, they refused to sign the treaties about, and they actually fought the war against the other powers, and they actually won. Yep. <laughs> <sighs> I can only imagine if that treaty actually would happen, how much disaster that would be. Hell, maybe Turkey would join the Axis in World War II to get back their stuff. Thank God for Ad Turk too. That was so neat, oh, so I'm okay. glad they won that Do you one. Know something interesting? About Did Ad you know Turk? that if Italy had joined the Central Powers in World War I, we would, have, we would have had the Ottoman Empire on the Allies' side? That's true as well, because they hated Italy after taking Libya from them a few years earlier. Alright, so that one disgusted me the most what they were going to do to the Ottomans. Thank God they managed to prevent that from happening. But the one that probably affected the most was Germany, of course. So, let's see. They had territory removed from them. Give, some were given to Poland, some were given to Denmark, which a little weird since Denmark wasn't involved. Some were given to Belgium. Also, Lorraine went back to France. And they had the reparations, which was really, really overkill for what they had to pay. They didn't even pay it off till 2010, if you didn't know that. That's how long it took to pay off all those reparations. To be fair, was, to be fair um, who was it? Um, who was it? I think it was mid twenties. They didn't. Um, they weren't really paying it off either. Yeah. So, but again, it still would have been a long time before. Yeah. It was like so like ridiculous how much they were gonna pay for the amount of time it would took, and then um, to, uh, I'm demilitarizing the Rhineland. The one th thing that was like probably overkill too is they were only allowed to have a hundred thousand troops. Remember across all of Germany, that's oh, yeah. that that is like way way too small of an army. They wouldn't even probably be able to defend themselves from like domestic terrorists or something like that with that small, let alone be a threat to anyone they else. They really didn't. They yeah. nearly didn't when the um, revolts in 1918 and 1919. Yeah, and Bavaria and all them. And then, of yeah. course, no air force, no tanks. Their navy was cut down massive, although it still seems pretty big size and all that. Like, they were, like, completely, like, disarmed to, like, a pretty much ridiculous extent. Like, they went, like, w probably honestly a little bit overkill of how much they demilitarized them. At least there was nothing with, um, compared to what... They talked about doing to them in World War Two. Yeah. And then, of course, the big one that was probably the deciding factor was them blaming Germany for World War II. I mean, World War Two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blaming them for Austria, causing World War One. not Germany. Austria, Hungary, and in fact, really just Austria, not Germany, yeah. who started World War One. The argument is that, oh, Germany gave Austria and Hungary the blank check to encourage them to start the war. They, in the end, there's only two groups of people that are responsible for it. One, like we already agree with, Austria-Hungary, because in the end, they invaded Serbia. They started it. Not Germany. Germany was just dragged on in. But if we want to be really honest, there's only one person really to blame for it. And you know who that is? Hey. Gavriel Princip. The man who assassinated Franz Ferdinand, remember? Yes, yes. Because if he didn't assassinate yep. him, the July crisis wouldn't have happened, which wouldn't have led to World War I in the first place, especially since Franz Ferdinand wanted to get um, Serbia a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, remember? Like a tri-kingdom, um, basically. Like, to give them rights and all that. Yeah. But, of course, the Allies went, like, so overkill, and a lot of it did lead to World War II. Too pretty well, much. That's what they usually. That's what they usually happened with the um those treaties at the time. Those treaties were insane, regardless of what side did it. Yeah. I mean, and, um, Germany um stole like when the, one of their thing with Russia, they stole a yep. third of Russia's population. Um, yep. basically, uh, when Romania surrendered, they basically turned uh, Romania into a German puppet state. Yeah, it was pretty gnarly and then of course when um the brest Litovsk treaty happened then it was revoked after they lost that led to yeah. massive problems in eastern europe for years and of course the russian civil war and all that <laughs> oh my god that was just a bunch of crap yeah unbelievable 
So anything else you want to say on this topic? In a way, World War One was going to somehow happen. Uh, the question would have been what might have kicked it off. And, well, in this timeline, it was the assassination of the Arch of Franz Ferdinand. And, of course, those trees were probably pretty overkill. The, Austria, although it was nice that it they were just broken up into, like, separate countries, but that still was kind of overkill at the same time to literally, like, break them up that much. The Turkey one was disgusting when they were going to try and colonize their actual Anatolian territory, and the shit with Germany is what led to World War II in a lot of ways. All right, so now, what do you want to talk about oh. next? Uh, Ro Khanna being a <laughs> moron. Oh, Ro, why? Why? So, for all of you don't know, Ro Khanna's a congressman, He's pretty damn good, progressive, but unfortunately, he just did, as I'm trying to find that tweet, where was it at? Oh yeah, he did a podcast with Bill Crystal, a disgusting neocon oh, warmonger, God. and Ro oh, tweeted... Oh God, the, world, the, guy, the guy who's been calling for World War Three for the past few, 10 plus years. This is Ro Khan's tweet. Bill Crystal is one of the most thoughtful voices in defending liberalism and democratic institutions in our country. Learned a lot from our conversation about shaping almost an inclusive narr narrative about American patriotism. He's um, a fucking neocon. The only thing he cares about is starting World War III. I think he is not a, not democratic. He is not a liberal. He is evil. I don't know, I can't remember if he actually responded to it or not, so I'm not fully sure, so don't take my word for it, but I think he did, and he was l like, um, why are everyone so mad about me talking to him? I can talk to whoever I want. If that is what you said, bro, that's not what we're talking about. We don't care if you talk to Bill Crystal, but the way you framed him made him sound like he's a good guy. He's not. He's awful. He's terrible. He's a warmongering piece of shit. And the fact that you framed him in such a way makes him sound good, is just not defendable. Nope. Oh, oh no, my no, no. god. Like, he is a neocon piece of shit that supports literally every single war America's gotten itself into. Yeah. Like, how can and you... He's been pushing for the war, for a war with Iran, which, out of the list of places that would escalate into World War Three, literally, war with Iran is only second to the Ukraine. And most thoughtful defended liberalism. He's not a liberal. And what not li a liberal. He would go. He would go around massacring liberals if he had the chance. I bet. I wouldn't be surprised if he's like, oh, he's defender liberals because he's like part of the um, Lincoln found Lincoln Project and is anti-Trump. Remember, these guys are only against Trump in terms of his mean tweets. When it comes to his policies, they agree with him on almost everything. It's just his yeah. style that they're against, not the actual yeah. substance. Well, also, they um, don't like that he's so explicit about being every negativist in the book. When a lot of them are too, but they're at least smart enough to keep it quiet. So, yeah, Ro, if you're going to talk to people like Crystal, please don't frame them like they're like a good guy, because they're not. But if you want to talk to them, go ahead. That wasn't the problem, but the problem was how you framed how you're talking to him as. Oh, God, like, come on, that should have been so obvious. Reminds me of that time, too, where, um, I think he, um, endorsed, um, AOC's opponent, remember, in the primaries of 2018? Yeah. Joker. And then when people call him up for it, like, oh, oh, I endorse AOC, too, then. <laughs> That's only a step up, right? <sighs> so anything else you want to say on this one? Do, 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 do. Uh, all right, so yeah, now, what do you want to talk good. about next? Uh, context of slur usage. I know. This the one's very interesting. This is another thing, too, that's really, really annoyed me lately. And it's, actually, it's not been lately. It's been several years with um, leftists online and such, where they're, like, so, so sensitive about, like, racial slurs and all that, that they literally can't understand, like, context to them. Like, they're the people, like, like, um, let me go find, um, Shu's tweet, because if you heard recently, that's what Shu got to a massive shit about recently. Did you know about okay, this? Okay, so this is the latest bit, right. Let me go find it. 
unless she deleted it. But anyways, she t I'm still looking for it. She's the white bat machine if she's deleted it. I found a video of one of her tweets. But anyways, she tweeted out economically lib I mean, economically left socially retarded. Now, the way she described it, and the way from what I heard after people talked about it, it to me it came across she's making fun of like populist right wingers who are somewhat good on like economic issues, but are batshit insane on social issues and all that. And oh my god, people had a fucking meltdown because she said retarded. Of course. Guys, she's not saying, I mean, she's not calling people a retard because they're having men, um, have a mental disability. She's calling them retarded because they have backwards insane views on social issues, which is not acceptable. If you're going to call those people retards, you're more than valid to do that because they are retarded. Who the hell is could be a support on being anti-social issues? Like, come on! And then, of course, this is um another thing with, like, the N-word, for example. Oh, my God. People have a meltdown with this. Like, I've seen, like, Hannah, Jake, Lance, and all this, like, don't, just don't say the N-word ever, especially if you're white. Pretty racist to say that whites can't ever say the N-word ever. Like, come on, man, um, that's ridiculous. I, okay, the, um, okay, the context for whites to use the N-word is probably quite thin normally, um, but to say that it's not okay in any context is too far. Yeah, like, there probably are a couple of contexts where you can. Yeah, like, for example, and... like, what if you're quoting someone that said it? Does that make you racist for saying, for quoting someone who said it before? Not, who says it necessarily has to be in the context of, like, being racist? What if someone just said it and it was just nothing? Like, not a big deal. Mm. Like, one thing that made a big deal about, do you know John Schlatter? Nope. He's the owner, well, the original um, creator of Papa John's, if you know what they are. Oh, okay. Ah, yeah. Okay, Papa John's I've heard of. Yeah, the pizza place. They, um, he, of course, he's a st stupid fucking, like, elitist, like, far-right dipshit. Like, he's, like, one, like, more, like, establishment, like, Republican figures. Like, he made a big deal back in 2012, like, uh, Obamacare's gonna force me to raise, um, the price of my pizza, like, 30 cents in order to cover everyone's health care, when it really is if I'm just gonna complain about it anyway, hey, and stuff like that. You're whinging about 30 cents. It was more like 8-something eight eight cents, but even if it was 30 cents, <laughs> that's nothing. But, back in 2007, he was, like, pretty much forced to resign from Papa John's, because he was in a meeting with a couple people about, like, I don't know if it was diversity training, but, like, anti-racism training. And he said the N-word in the context of how to, like, avoid racism and stuff, like, historical and all that. He was forced to resign because of that. What? Uh, That's bullshit. Dude. That's stupid. And Sh and Lance from the Surf made a big deep me said made fun of Schlatter for saying that. Like, don't, st just don't say this stuff like that. That's not the context he was using for to be racist. He was criticizing racism by bringing it up in context of historical racism and came to, like, businesses and stuff like that. How is it that hard to understand? There's nothing wrong with using that context. And here's another context, too. What if you're, like, going off a script, like, say you're, like, a voice actor or something like that, and the script has you saying it. Does that make you racist for saying it then? No. no. What if it's in a song? What if it's part of the lyrics of a song? Does that make you racist? No. There are times where saying slurs are not bad, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. Just like what Shu said here was funny, and for all of you made a big deal about it, you're just a bunch of fucking morons and a bunch of crybabies, and it's not a big deal. Oh my fucking God. So anything you want to say on this? Oh, yeah. Context matters. Like, for me, for example, I don't know about you, but I actually have a cousin who has really, really bad Down syndrome. I would, I would never, ever call her a retard. Why? Because that's ableist, and it's really cringy. Remember all the videos, like, TYT covers of, like, 
crazy um, people screaming, yelling it at um, mentally disabled people. It's really, really cringy and just awful. So I'm never going to call her that. And if anyone called her that or anyone else who had mental disabilities, yeah, that would be ableist. But calling people a retard because they're bat shit insane and fucking stupid and advocate for terrible ideas? Open house, I'm going to call him a retard and you're going to fucking deal with it. How about that? Just like I'll yep. say the N-word in the context of quoting someone or part of a script or anything like that or any of the other slurs. It doesn't make you an ism for saying it. It all depends on the context. Oh my fucking God. Why can't... Why is it that leftists can't ever understand this? I just don't get it. We're supposed to be the side that understands nuance and all this stuff. Not conservatives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anything you want to say about before we get to the next topic? I feel so weird with that. It's like... And what it... And it's, it is one of those things where... You, you do. It's going to be... It's really weird. Oh my god. And, yeah. So, fat acceptance. Oh, though this one applies to me too as I turn off my dad switch. So, of course, fat acceptance is the movement that advocates, well, it's more of like a nuanced thing. And I actually saw a video from um Hunter Avalon's older videos like a week or so ago. He used to be, unfortunately, a big problem with like the f criticizing the fat acceptance movement. Where's that video at? This one, I think, was too bad in comparison to the other ones but let's go watch it let me turn on That's ad good. blocker <laughs> oh and this is another thing that triggers like leftist like hunter stand-ups if you ever seen them oh god that they are cringe this one was, i thought was actually pretty <laughs> funny <laughs> Do I even want to know? Oh, hello, Father. Back from the clan meeting already? <laughs> no, actually, I'm back from work. You know, not everyone can receive a welfare check at the end of the month. What are you even doing? I am participating in the Fat Acceptance new, empowering, and inspiring hashtag, hashtag Scream at a Veggie. <laughs> what? I mean, aren't, aren't vegetables good for fat people? They help them lose weight and live longer, healthier lives. Uh -huh. Father, it is that exact mentality that I am protesting against. Healthy? Lose weight? It's all just code for fascist standards being forced on fat people's bodies. And believe it or not, I've actually seen um, fat acceptance people actually do say that. So he's not wrong to stereotype that. They, I've seen people on Twitter literally do say stuff like that. And it's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you ask me, okay. At people. least in that case, he's actually got people who have actually said that, which is more than I can say for most conservatives. Yep. Brand cake down their esophagus. It's forcing <laughs> diabetes on their bodies. You know, I wish I had a safe space right now because you are being so <laughs> racist and fatphobic. But then again, I don't want to be too hard on people who cram things down their esophagus. Then I'd be bashing your career, femson. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you think you're so funny, Father, and what's your career? Throwing people in the oven? Hitler! <laughs> well, let's hope not. If I threw someone in the oven, they might be baked just enough that a fat person would want to eat them. <laughs> this is too good. <laughs> Keep your hate speech out of this kitchen! Keep your hate speech out of this kitchen! <laughs> here is done. Welcome, that was your favorite great. narcissistic white boy Hunter Avalon here. <sighs> and welcome to another video. And Seth, I think... I think this was back in, um, 2018 or 2019, so this was back when Hunter was still a conservative, so he might still say some cringy stuff in here, but I still thought it was largely good video, so let's continue on. Yeah. Just really quick, don't forget to add me on you now. You can download the app by clicking let's the link in my description up. below and add me at the username at Hunter Avalon. Now, everyone, today we will be talking about something I've talked about before and I will continue talking about until it finally dies. That's right, everyone. Today we are talking about our familiar friend, the Fat Acceptance Movement. Now, for those who don't know, the Fat Acceptance Movement or the Body Positivity Movement is, uh, it's actually a movement that, well, it, it lacks quite a lot of movement. It's all about loving your fat body, accepting yourself just the way you are, and claiming that every size is beautiful. I know, I know. 
What the absolute hell is this hippie crap? However, more often than not, the movement is dribbled down to a slew of nonsense, frothing from the cake-stained mouths of idiotic fat people. The fat acceptance movement has become a safe haven for fat people either claiming victim status or being a little too proud of the fact that they're fat. Thanks to the fat acceptance movement, several fat people now believe they are somehow a victim simply because they are overweight. Seriously, I'm pretty sure that some fat people eat like three donuts, rush over to their Facebook, just so they can change their status to oppressed. Eating cake does not make you a victim. If you got yourself into this mess, you can dig yourself out. In an article written by Angela Meadows, a woman who specializes in fat stigma, she claims fat people are facing discrimination and, that's right, microaggressions. Well, to uh, all the fat people who currently have microaggressions, I just say congratulations, you finally have something that isn't gigantic. According to the article, <laughs> here's a few microaggressions fat people might face. People watching them while they're eating in a restaurant or checking out the contents of their trolley in the super- Well, it's also not as simple simple as um oh to stop eating a lot and you will lose weight a lot of people even if they don't eat a lot it still is very difficult for them to lose weight like some people are just fundamentally different like a lot of people could just eat a lot and don't gain any weights whatsoever some people can eat very little we and made. they gain a lot of weight and, uh, that's still me to uh hide that's still me to quite a bit yeah so it's not that's one thing that's a little bit cringy when it says that way it's, there's a lot more nuance it's to it. It's also the problem when it comes to obesity, and this is why my dad went and got such radical surgery. Hey, my um, dad too. He actually, he was at a point where he couldn't lose weight. Some reason I feel like that's the case it for me was... too now. <laughs> and I'm on the bike like all day, pretty much. What are you? What are you um, at at the moment? Uh, this morning I think it was two seventy eight. Okay. God, I remember back when it was like 250, like April of last year. Oh. I've been like fluctuating between like that and 270 for like the last five plus years. Sometimes I get... Oh, God, yeah, you you really... And how tall are you? Five, seven and a half. I'm way... Jeez. Yeah, I, 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 like I say, I, I um, exercise like all... I mean, not all day, but... Every day, at least, I try to get some, but it's just, like, very difficult to lose weight. And, of course, it doesn't help that I don't... You, you've crossed that point with the um, obesity where it's going to be... Your, you you are really going to struggle. Um, I mean, I start off... Uh, I'm going to say it right now. Uh, if you could... Um, if, you, if you had universal health... Care, which sadly we I don't. reckon you probably you probably could do it, you probably would be need to do have a gastric sleeve, um where you have what my dad had, which is have most of your stomach removed. That's what it my dad had your, too. Um, it reset basically for whatever reason, it um resets all the hunger, well things and all that. My my dad actually had it because he used to be over four hundred, and then after oh. like. And then a year or so afterwards, he got, like, all the way down to, like, 280. But now he's all the way back up to 360. Oh, no. Yeah, so. So, and, of course, he had, oh, my God, he had a rough, rough experience going for that surgery. Throwing up all the time, diarrhea all the time, which a lot of that stuff he still has this day. So, I don't think that would be a good idea, honestly, for me. Yeah, he, um. You gotta do this, all the psychology. There's a whole bunch of psychology stuff you gotta do beforehand. Um, I, my dad was preparing for this surgery yeah. psychologically. I don't think for my over dad a year before he had it. I don't think mine did. I think he just went and just did it. <laughs> yeah, that is no. That's a recipe for disaster. I mean, at the same that time, is a he's disaster. I mean, at the same time, at least he's nowhere near the 450 he used to be. Just like me. I, my dad, my dad was 310 pounds. That's the highest. And facing I, not making it to 60. That was the highest I ever weighed back in 2014. And I've gotten all the way down to like the 270, 250 range ever since. My dad is now fluctuating between 202 and 210. And how tall is he? Uh, 5 foot 11. So he's only overweight now. But he can't get too much lower because then he starts feeling sick. Yeah, it's like very difficult. And of course, it also doesn't help that, one, I don't eat healthy food because it just tastes like fucking garbage to me. And sadly, when we get a lot of money, especially my mother, we like to eat out a lot. <laughs> oh, so that's yeah, another that problem. would do it. That would do it. Like, 
My mother can never say no to eating out when given the opportunity for food. I mean, going get getting money, oh. ever. She can't say no, just like I can't say no to playing, like, Pokemon games and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, my God. So, let's continue on. I mean, staring at anyone is definitely... Oh, yeah, 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 that, that first one he said about... Um, face. People watching them while they're eating in a restaurant. Yeah, people say, um... People are being oppressed because people are watching them eat at restaurants and stuff like that. I'm sure that happens for a lot of fat people. I've never seen it happen to me. But then again, when I'm eating at a restaurant, I don't pay attention to people looking at me or I don't look at people. I either eat or play games. And same goes for Super Mike when my mother. I just play on the Switch and stuff like that. I don't look around at people, seeing them eat or what they're carrying or anything like that. So maybe it's more people being like too focused on things that are not important. Yep. Out the contents of the trolley in the supermarket. And that is cringy too if you're looking at people eating and being like disgusted by it. If you're disgusted by it, just don't look at them eat then. Hey like, God, I mean, how rude. Is yeah. kind of rude. It's just sometimes a little difficult not to look at fat people because there's just so much of them to look at. It's like you're <laughs> over here, you turn this way, you're That's still so cringy, at Hunter. TV or in a film. Oh yeah, that one bugs, that one's annoying too that people make a big deal of. Fat jokes on TV. Uh, I'm fat. I, get, I see fat jokes all the time. I find them funny. I make them myself too. It's not really that big of a deal. Everything is wide open to, for jokes. You gotta learn to be able to like have a little bit of humor in yourself to just take a little bit of a joke. It ain't that yep. big of a deal. Everyone be, it's made fun of. Well, you don't think skinny people are made fun of too? Like anorexic jokes all the time? They are. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. A, a fat joke on TV? Now this is just too far. A slimmer friend asking if she looks fat in this. I mean, the slimmer friend is asking because clearly you have experience looking fat in things. We're even wondering whether they will be taken seriously when they go to a doctor with a sprained ankle, or just told to go away and lose some weight. Literally all of these microaggressions could be avoided if you just didn't get fat in the first place. It's a really lazy mentality to suggest that society. I mean, it's not always the case. Maybe you have something wrong with your ankles too. Not just related to your health. Like my mother has that. She's not fat at all. Change for you, rather than you changing for society. And listen, just if there's a stigma around being fat, does not mean that fat people are poor, large victims. In fact, I honestly think there should be a bit of a stigma around being fat. The U.S. has an obesity issue, and it's the second leading cause of preventable death. This isn't something that should be accepted and encouraged. In a time like this, we don't need fat acceptance. We need fat resistance. Now it's very well. Now I think he actually talks about this too. But here's the thing about like fat acceptance. It's nuanced, and a lot of times both sides are like too like both sides are like wrong about it. I mean, yeah, the fat acceptance people are wrong to say it's healthy because, no, being fat is not healthy at all. You're an idiot if you think that. But at the same time, they also have a point, though, when it comes to, like, discrimination. That does exist. And I think Ponter talks about this in this video, too, where people are, like, denied jobs because they're fat, even though the job literally has no dependence on them being fat whatsoever being, like, mocked and laughed at for being fat. Like, happens to me all the time online dealing with stupid conservatives. I'm mocked all the time with for being all fat. That, yes, I see that. And other things, too. Like, come on, man. It's not that big of a... Like, why do you gotta um, make fun of people for being fat? It's not... Not every time it's controllable, for God's sake. You, you gotta be able to understand. So, like, be against um, fat shaming people, discriminate against them for being fat and all that. But at the same time, yeah, point out that they're... The fat acceptance movements are incorrect to say that being fat is healthy. It's wrong, and the people that make fun of people for being fat and all that are wrong too. Comment among fat activists for them to assume they're always a victim, or if something unfortunate happens to them, it's definitely because they were fat. In an article posted earlier this year from Huffington Post titled, I was kicked off the Harry Potter ride for being too fat for the seats. The author basically claimed she was kicked off of the ride due to body discrimination. Trust me, this article <laughs> is so dumb you think the Huffington Post huffed glue before publishing it. The story begins with our friend Chunky having fun at the amusement park when she's notified by her other fat friend that earlier she was asked to get off a specific ride. My dear friend Rua, who's been a guest on my Woman of Size podcast about the discrimination against fat women's bodies, wrote, Heads up, I was kicked off the Hogwarts ride because I didn't fit. Despite being warped. Well, that is another, <clears throat> that actually happened, I haven't been on a ride that I was too big to ride on, but rides that are like, have like a weight limit, I just don't bother on, because yeah, you being fat in a lot of ways is somewhat of a safety hazard when it comes to a roller coaster. Remember, first off, they have to make sure you are safely inside the harness before they can start the roller coaster, so you don't fly out or anything like that. So, you need to be able to fit in there, and then also... Your weight can also affect the speed of a roller coaster too, which could cause problems like in turns and all that. So yeah, health limits, you know, weight limits are kind of needed, just like rides have height limits too, so you don't fly out of the yep. safety harness. Yep, there are there, there was a couple of rides at um, uh, Movie World on the Gold Coast uh, that I couldn't go on because I was too tall. Hell, there's even one at the um, Royal Adelaide Show. In my home city, 
that I can't go on because the maximum height's 190 centimeters and I'm 196. Yeah, I remember growing up too, there was like so many rides I wanted to go on, but uh, you're too short, you can't ride it, which sucks, but it's all about safety. It has nothing to do with you being discrimination of being fat or anything like that. It's just safety. Or Chunky decides to get on the ride and then is shocked when she's asked to get off. One of the 20 something ride men. That reminds me too, like go karting down here. Like a lot of times I'm so big in go karts, they have to give me like a double seat belt for me to get, um, put the seat belt on or give me like extra like cushions so I can all move up more so they can push it in all that. It's all just about health and safety to make sure you're safe when you ride the ride. And just walked over and asked us to step off because of safety issues. We rushed her through a door. Yeah, but it is safety issue. Where another 20 something employee rattled off a spiel about safety and three clicks. That's when we all knew that I hadn't actually made it on to the Hogwarts ride. Well, those darn employees and their pathetic little spiels about safety. The experience didn't entirely. <laughs> yeah, they're required to uh, make sure you're safe. Otherwise they can get sued for or like you dying or something like that. Like, how can anyone not see this and realize, yeah, it makes sense. This is like part of the fat acceptance movement that's really silly. My day, but I wonder how I would have reacted had I not already built up a small community of women in comedy dealing with similar body discrimination. Yeah, guys, you, you heard this correctly. Body discrimination. Uh, no, you put on weight. Your weight is now a safety issue. It's not body discrimination. You know what, hold the phone. What, what am I even saying? I'm being such a major bigot right now. You know, if that amusement park was really accepting of fat people, they would let you get on the ride. Risk breaking the ride, risk your safety and other people's safety, and risk getting a major lawsuit from a woman who sweats bacon grease. Curse the fat public. Exclusion and shame are not motivational techniques. They're forms of bullying. Exclusion makes me, a logical and educated person, believe that I'm at fault for not fitting into this ride instead of recognizing that pride should accommodate all people's bodies. Uh, yeah, you were kicked off. The problem is not, you can't just refit a roller coaster to fit bigger people. That's like, do you have any idea how much money and time it would take to do that? Not only you had to make like bigger like roller coaster trains, but then you had to resize the station, probably redesign the entire ride so it's safe because if it's too big, it might hit something else or might go off the track or something like that. Like, you gotta realize how silly you sound to advocate for that. Off the ride because you were overweight and you're still eating a deep fried sugar stick i don't think you're very logical but seriously this is a perfect example of demanding society change for you rather than you changing for society rides simply cannot accommodate all body sizes that just doesn't make any sense this is no different than when small children can't ride rides because they're too small you yeah, have to like we said earlier own safety or someone else's safety while safety is often the given reason that fat people are excluded it's clear to us that companies are actually just keeping the general public safe from our fatness ladies and gentlemen here is all the proof you need that the fat acceptance movement or the body positivity movement encourages a victim mentality in fat people no company is keeping anyone safe from fatness companies want your money they don't care if you're big or small welcome to capitalism this is not limited to only you and your weight, yet you twist the story to try and paint yourself as the victim. Trust me, the only thing you're a victim to is diabetes. On the other side of this mess, we don't have people who use their fat to try and claim victim status, but instead use their fat as some form of empowerment. I think Tess Holiday is an excellent example of this. You know that annoying fat liberal model who was just featured on the front of a health magazine? Yeah, her. But hey, let's not jump to conclusions. If anything, putting her on the front of the magazine will encourage more people to go to the gym, or else they'll look like an elephant in a swimsuit. In an interview from a few years ago, <laughs> author Lindy West spoke about coming out as fat. In your new book, you talk quite a bit about coming out as fat and learning to accept and embrace the label. How would you come out as fat to people in your life, and especially at work? I mean, I did have a kind of dramatic coming out as fat event at work. That's right, everyone. Fat people can now come out as fat. Wow, how brave. How empowering. How inspiring. The only difference is, instead of them coming out of the closet, they come out of the local Dunkin' Donuts. And it's, a, it's a long, slow process of people uh, learning to, uh, you know, learning not to hate their bodies and learning to, to stick up for themselves and to demand respect. Yeah. You shouldn't hate your body or who you are, but you absolutely should hate the fact that you are overweight and unhealthy. Hating one changeable flaw of yourself does not mean you hate your body or hate yourself as a person. The great thing is, if you love your body, you can work to improve it and change it for the better. I do agree that yep. you stick up for yourself, but demanding respect? I mean, really? No offense, but look at yourself. With a body like that, I don't think you respect yourself. Why should you demand respect from others if you don't even respect yourself? And we close this video with me smugly telling you, I was right. Not only does the fat acceptance movement encourage fat people to be annoying whiny <laughs> bitches, not only does the fat acceptance movement encourage people to be way too proud about things they just shouldn't be proud of, the fat acceptance movement contributes to obesity. According to Yahoo News, newly released research could strike a blow to the body positivity movement because it shows that the normalization of larger body sizes is leading to increasing numbers of people underestimating their weight. Consequently, some individuals are not making an effort to lose weight or maintain a healthy weight. The study showed that the number of overweight people who underestimate their weight has increased over time, from 48.4% to 57.9% in men and 24.5% to 30.6% in women between 1997 and 2015. And that's not good. Is in a movement called body positivity, which seeks to end fat shaming, increase self-esteem, and generally make people feel good in their own skin. And this is the problem with the body positivity movement. If you look like this, you should not feel good in your own body. A lot of people want to claim that I'm just a jerk or that I hate. But this, <clears throat> that's true, but at the same time, too, you shouldn't fat shame them either for being fat. Like, yeah. and a lot of it, it's not easy to lose weight. I've been trying for, like, seven years. I've lost, like, 30-plus pounds right now since I started off at 310, so that's good progress. But I've made only down to 244. That was five years ago now. I've been stuck at 250 to 270 ever since. It's not that easy, especially when I exercise all day. You got to be able to recognize, and it's not always the case that everyone just chooses to be fat too. Some people are just like naturally inclined to that even when they're not trying to. Like, it, like this is why both sides are just wrong on this. 
And then, of course, another thing, too, I never bring up. Remember, like, people say, like, being fat is beautiful? Well, people make fun of them for that, but in the end, that is just subjective. There are people who do like yeah. fat people as attractive, and who are you to judge them for what they like? Just because it's not what you like, and that's not what the majority of people like, I mean, there's nothing wrong with them liking it. But at the same time, too, point out that's not healthy. Just have a little bit of nuance in this. Like, it ain't that hard. And that's it's coming not from... not all one or all the other. Yep. And that's coming from the fat fuck of me. <laughs> so now, what do you want to talk about next? Uh, Mike's leftist infighting video. Oh, uh, yeah. Haven't you noticed... This has been going on... Honestly, Mike even brings this up about ever when um, Bernie dropped out last year. This has been a thing I noticed, too, since Biden became president. And especially since, like... The last month or so, especially like the infight between Jimmy Dore and everyone else, it is getting like so absolutely ridiculous. And I thought Mike's video was really, really good on that subject. As let's watch it. Well, the ratio on this video is probably going to be pretty bad, but I mean, look, it somebody's got to say it, folks. Somebody has got to say it. But before I even begin to speak about anything, let's just take a moment collectively as the online left to just. Take a deep breath. Let's just try to chill. If you have time, commit yourself to try to go outside and touch grass. Because I promise you, being terminally online 100% of the time is not good for your health. It's not good for your physical health. It's also not good for your mental health. I speak from experience. Now, unfortunately for me, the best that I can do is touch synthetic grass here. But even just doing this, like, this makes me feel better. Every once in a while, we just have to step back, take a deep breath, I'll go play and try to recalibrate. Some Understand games that our instead. How about that? They are justifiable. <laughs> drive us into irrational territories. And being irrational for too long leads to situations like we're currently dealing with right now. And I'm not necessarily even sure how to describe the situation that I want to talk about. So my, my thoughts are a little bit scattered here, but I'll just say it, the online left is a complete disaster since Bernie Sanders ended his 2020 campaign. It's a, it's a mess. If you log on to Twitter right now, you will probably immediately um, explode in anger, you'll start doom scrolling, you'll start spiraling, and it's just a mess right now. And I think that every once in a while we have to remind ourselves, what are we doing, why are we doing what we're doing, and how do we make ourselves more effective? And to even suggest that perhaps maybe the left collectively online anyways has gone astray is in and of itself controversial. But understand that a lot of what's happening on Twitter right now, a lot of the leftists infighting, it's pretty insular. Most normal people, thankfully, most leftists even in the United States and internationally, have no idea what's going on on Twitter. They have no idea about the amount of infighting. Thank God, like if any of my normie uh, liberal family members saw what's going on on Twitter, they think that we're more unhinged as leftists than they already do, right? It's already bad enough trying to or hard enough, I should say, trying to convince them to support more socialistic policies, uh, so socialist politicians like Bernie Sanders. They are incorrect to think that too. The AOC. But if you log on to Twitter, it's like, holy fucking shit, people are losing their minds. Um, and I'm not gonna get too specific because if I, if I name names that I'm literally feeding into it further and giving the people who are trying to drive instability and anger in the left exactly what they want, because unfortunately there are a lot of nefarious individuals and opportunistic individuals who try to drive a wedge between people because that is exactly what gets them views and clicks, right? So if I were to make a video titled, fuck Kyle Kalinsky, I love Kyle, but if I made a video titled, fuck Kyle Kalinsky, that would probably get like 50,000, 100,000 views because people love drama. The algorithm feeds into drama. So if you can keep people in a sustained state of anger, then that gets them coming back. Eventually, you cultivate this audience where they're in this, your viewers are in this parasocial relationship with you and they have to tune in to find out what to be angry about. And there sure is a lot of things to be angry about. I'm constantly in a state of perpetual anger. But oftentimes, if you're just in that state of anger nonstop, it will eat away at your brain. And again, every once in a while, you have to recalibrate. So we're getting to a point on the left where I think that we all have to be a little bit introspective, myself included, and recalibrate. So I'm trying to figure out where I want to go with this because it's like stepping on a bunch of fucking landmines. But um, let me just say that the squad, AOC, Cory Bush, these individuals are not your enemies. I think that it is perfectly justifiable if you are feeling disillusioned with members of Congress and the squad even because they praise Joe Biden far too much and go along with the establishment far too much. I understand that. I, I tend to have that criticism and agree with these folks. Having said that, though, to me... Yeah, I actually bring that up all the time, but people just criticize me for saying that and all that. <laughs> oh, my God. Did you even see Cori Bush recently did a really... Oh, that's what I think I post on here where she did that really stupid tweet where there's no such thing as um anti... You know, reverse oh, racism. Yes. Like, no, Cory... There is a such thing as reverse racism, and although it's not anywhere near as big as the right thinks of it in the leftist community, there are leftists online that really are just racist against whites and sexist against men. They exist. Yeah. Don't deny it. I deal with them all the time. I'm regularly dismissed because I'm a fifth white man and all that. So don't act like they don't exist. They fucking do, and it's not debatable, and they need to be condemned just like actual racists on the right. The public enemy yeah. nothing for the left. It only makes us look so, unhinged. Uh, I think I'm going to say one thing here. It is really not, it's not reverse racism, it's just racism. Yep. Just because somebody, somebody. it's casual racism and not systemic that doesn't diminish its racism. Oh yeah, because they do like that, Ugh, us being bigoted against whites, it's not racism. It, racism is, um... Prejudice plus power and all that crap, remember? So it's impossible yeah, for in us... In the United States of America, it's being white. It's not... But remember, black people... There are some black... Not black people. Black nationalists who literally believe 
that white people were genetically designed to be racist. Yep. <laughs> Don't tell me these people. Oh and, no, oh, and even better, because a lot of these black nationalist groups are also anti-Semitic, they believe they were created, that white people were created by a Jew to be racist. <laughs> But you see, they can't implement their um racism, so they're not actually racist, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking dipshit! Oh my god. Who is like the closest to us ideologically speaking? Um, the squad is not our enemies, and I shouldn't have to say that. You can be disillusioned with the squad, but it's gotten so bad that people are already pre-canceling Nina Turner, who hasn't even been elected yet, who would be one of the strongest fighters. But people just like look for every little thing to um be angry at, right? So there were the incredible Medicare for all that took place, and there were some terminally online individuals who were trying to attack Nina Turner because she wasn't there. But Nina Turner has less than a week until her election takes place. So it's really important that she's out in Ohio on the ground canvassing people to go to her door. Now, could she have tweeted about the march? Sure, sure, that's a perfectly valid criticism. But to like totally write off Nina Turner as an individual and just automatically uh, assume that she... No, but at the same time, it would be nice if she brought it up, just like the squad would have been nice to bring it up too. And of course, yeah. not be like idiots like Bosh and for... Make it from dismissing completely because Door was involved. There being a bunch of partisan hacks. The only thing I'd have is um, is I don't uh, like if you're gonna be think about it, critique the very specific rally that Door was at. Don't attack all of them. If you really want to, just attack, just criticize the one that Door was at, and leave the other thirty nine alone. You right wing fuckwits. But they can't help it. They just hate, they have such a hatred for door that they can't put that aside to anything. <laughs> is, so, um, is kind of absurd, and you have to understand who the real enemies are. You can criticize your allies in Congress, but they shouldn't be public enemy number one. Like, if you demonize AOC and the squad and you're disappointed in them, okay, but perhaps Director Iyer at the individuals were actually holding us back. Even if AOC, so for example, there's a lot of people that were angry that AOC didn't tweet about Medicare for all marches. And I think that that's, that's reasonable, right? It would have been way to use her platform to do that. But that doesn't mean that AOC is a sellout. And just me saying that AOC isn't a sellout is in and of itself a cancelable offense. But you have to understand, people, that AOC, even if she did everything that we wanted her to do, the issue is that AOC is just one member of Congress, right? AOC doesn't have some magical Medicare for all that she can press that... Your turn to take notes here. What? Your turn to take notes here, Jimmy Dore. Yeah, but at the same time, too, they still need to fight, even if they are, like, very yep. few people. That is also yep. true as well. But when we point that out, people like Vosh and all of them criticize us and have a meltdown for us doing it. Hell, even some of them have just accused me outright of being a racist and a sexist for criticizing them. <laughs> yeah, that, the, and that is probably my main thing that I am so annoyed at Jimmy Dore for. Because he has, even if he has doesn't mean it, he has been racist towards the squad in the past. And as a result, because he's so divide and because he's so divisive, right I wanna say the word shit lib, but I think there might be something similar there. But idiots like Vorsch who despise Jimmy Dore, probably more, as much if not more than Dore despises Vosh, will use that to claim that all criticism of AOC is racist and sexist. <laughs> it's fucking ridiculous. Just because <laughs> Dore is, just because Dore is, is an unhinged lunatic that, who goes way, who goes too far with some of his criticisms of AOC does not mean all criticisms of AOC are wrong. And likewise, you still and need to criticize them too, which Vosh and them do not ever want to do. They do the reverse. They don't want to ever criticize like them said, ever. You've got, to, you've got to sit in a happy medium between Vosh never criticizing them and Jimmy Dore going way too far with criticizing them. It gives us Medicare for all. That's not the way that it works, unfortunately. I wish that it were that easy, but that's not actually the world that we're living in. She can't do that. So even if AOC all of a sudden became even more radical took the advice of the online left, the terminally online individuals, myself included, I'm in this category, and she became a communist and like went full like, fuck the Democratic Party, fuck Nancy Pelosi. Still, that would be awesome to see, but would that get us any closer to Medicare for all? No, because we have to really tend to- It still would be nice if she did that though, that would be awesome. Like, yeah, because every once in a while, our anger drives us to irrational places to where we see someone who's actually an ally to us as not just an enemy, but public enemy number one. And the reason why AOC is so hated by the online left after being loved by her is because there are some individuals with very large followings that get extra views and clicks when they shit on someone like AOC. Why? Well, because there's already a substantial portion of the online left who's disappointed in AOC, so you have all those people, you know, automatically clicking when they see a video demonizing AOC. But on top of that, you 
a lot of right wingers told them out of their way to demonize AOC. So you get left wingers and right wingers all congregating to these videos where you know leftists shit on AOC, and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, this this these views are great. Uh, that's that's the feedback loop. You know that you give them what they want, they give you what you want in exchange, views and clicks, and then you start doing it again and again. And with time, eventually you start to cultivate this perception that AOC is public enemy number one. When there are people in Congress who actually have power, I'm talking about Hakeem Jeffries, I'm talking about Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, I'm talking about Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin. I'm talking about the Republicans, the Koch network, who's literally fighting even a Medicaid expansion, or a Medicare expansion, excuse me, that Bernie Sanders is pushing for. Bernie Sanders is fighting tooth and nail to lower the eligibility age for Medicare from 65 to 60, and also he's trying to expand benefits, so it uh, includes dental, hearing, and vision. I almost went dental and like went into my eyes. But you get the point, right? I'm trying to do Bernie Sanders, that's what he does. Anyways, <laughs> um, and, and the Koch network is literally fund funding an astroturf campaign against Bernie Sanders. So understand that there are a lot of enemies in politics, and your anger is justified. But if you're not directing it at the right people, then you're not going to affect change. That's just a fact. And it's frustrating because people are in no in positions. So to go back to the Medicare for March, which was great by the way, which I talked about on my show. Um, and side note, I got lambasted for not talking about it when I actually did talk about it. This is like what I mean when people are just like looking for reasons to be mad at me. And yeah, he did talk about it. So all you had to say, Mike didn't talk about it, you're a bunch of idiots. When, on the left, when we're not each other's enemies, we're actually allies. But Cory Bush showed up to the Medicare for All March, which is phenomenal. To have a sitting member of Congress endorse these nationwide marches, that's really, really incredible. But you had some people online attacking me. One person filmed a video, and I won't name this person because this is a really small council, so I don't want to direct harassment towards them. But one person was really mad that Cory Bush showed up to the march, and she said that she didn't support force the vote because it was overly divisive. Now I supported force the vote, contrary to popular belief, because I thought it was a good tactic. I wanted to see a lot about Medicare for All, even if that wouldn't actually. The funny thing is, Corey, about being divisive, it's going to be divisive no matter what, so why not just fucking support it? You're pretty much viewed as divisive for not supporting it. And speaking of forced to vote, that also brings up, brings up another thing about Vosh, too. Remember when we was on Crystal and Kyle and Friends, and Kyle brought up about forced to vote, and he said, like, forget me, put Jimmy Dore aside, I think forced to, me forced to vote was a valid strategy. We got, tell me why I'm wrong. And remember what Vosh said? Why would I criticize it? You took out Jimmy Dore. <laughs> so he just admitted he's only yeah. against... He was I only... <laughs> said, I figured out that, um... Then, Borsch, why don't you just... Why don't you just be like, all right, I'm, uh, I'm angry at this particular demonstration because they platformed an unhinged lunatic in Jimmy Dore. You should have said that. The funny thing... If you said that, that would have been... If the other 39 alone, that would have been fine. But I find it funny how he literally admitted that he has no criticism about force to vote other than door. That was he. That's what he literally admitted. <laughs> and another thing too about force to vote. Don't you remember? I don't know if you saw, but one of his videos about door. He pretty much said that force to vote is the stupidest idea ever and would never work and should never be done. But then when he was on Crystal and Kyle's friend when they talked about, it, he said the idea was defensible and possibly be a good idea and he might support it depending on the circumstances so what is it boss on your channel it's a stupid terrible idea that should never be done or when you're talking to kyle it's a valid strategy and maybe he would support it. which one is it hmm i think part of the question would be i think the honest question would be does he believe that it's a that it's a um viable strategy now or has he still attacked it he probably still has attacked. I wouldn't be surprised because in the end, we know the real reason why he was against it. You know it. I Dora. know it. He was only against it because Dora was involved. If you took Dora out, if Dora had literally nothing involved in whatsoever, maybe he probably would support it. And that yeah. is fucking pathetic. Even if you don't like him, you should not put the policy oh, aside. Like, I don't like Biden, but if he supported forced to vote, I might question his sincerity because I probably wouldn't believe it. I would at least give him credit for that. Like, come on, you have to put your hatred of people aside and work on solutions if you agree on the solutions. You got to. Yeah. Like, Jesus yeah. Christ. This is like the same people that made a big deal when Bernie would be willing to work with Republicans on issues, remember? Yeah. yeah you're in Bonham and they're all, all the isms. And, uh. Shut the fuck up. If they support the same policies as you do, you fucking take it when you have the opportunity. God damn. Lead to Medicare falling caught by the law. I think it was a useful, you know, theatrical tactic. Uh, but it didn't happen. But it's a mere disagreement of, of political tactics to get us closer to Medicare for all. And the fact that Cory Bush dared to say, well, I, I don't support it because it's divisive, then that person attacks Cory Bush, basically proving her right. And then after that, subsequently, Cory Bush was attacked by other individuals saying, oh, well, she, she doesn't even care about Medicare for all. She didn't tweet about it and she just showed up for a photo op. It's like, okay, folks, this is why I say we have to recalibrate. We have to go outside and touch grass. They're in this no in position. Members of the squad are in no in position. Where nothing they do can prove that they are worthy. Nina Turner. They would prove they're worthy to me if they fight for it. Hasn't even been elected, and people are already yeah. brushing her off. She's gonna fight for her life. The establishment certainly thinks that Nina Turner. I don't know who the hell would br um, brush Nina Turner off. She is fucking base, and hopefully she wins next week. Is uh, a threat, but yet you have some people who are terminally online, primarily on Twitter, who are like already saying it doesn't matter if she's elected or not because you know she's not gonna fight. So we might as well get the corporate Democrat who's being funded by the pro-Israel lobby. That's not what they're saying. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> and it's really frustrating to me because 
I don't even know what to do going forward. This is what happens when there's no leadership on the left. This is why I think that the end of Bernie Sanders campaign has been so damaging to the left. Because when there's no leadership there to kind of guide people's anger, you know, a vacuum opens up and opportunistic actors kind of like pounce and they try to direct people in ways that get them disempowered and, you know, leave them perpetually anger, angry and powerless. And that's that's a real issue here on the left. Um, and so the People's Party, for example, um, they did a march outside of AOC's office and a lot of really wonderful people showed up to this, right? Susan Sarandon, Christian Smalls, uh, Savage Joy, people who are, are great, well-intentioned people. But the People's Party could be using the organizational power that they have to fight someone like Nancy Pelosi or people on powerful committees blocking Medicare for All from even getting a floor vote. But instead, they, they protest an ally, and it's frustrating to see this because it makes us look unhinged. Like, I'm thinking of, like, my normie family members who are MSNBC liberals. If they found out about this, they'd see, you're unhinged. You Bernie support. They would be incorrect to think that. Are fucking, uh, you're attacking your own, so it's best that we just disregard you. Um, and the thing that worries me about this is it looks like it's, it's a PR stunt for the people's campaign not to pick on them, but I kind of am. It's like they have, they have an incentive to demonize members of the squad to, you know, push people into the people's party. Now, we already have a green party. But we need a People's Party, according to them, because the Green Party is, you know, too socialistic. I'm not necessarily sure what the rationale is. I had Nick Bonham on my program a really long time ago to talk about, like, the draft burning movement. And that didn't go anywhere. But the issue is that if you suggest to people, all right, the Democratic Party is incapable of reform. You might be right about that. I think we really have to have an inside-outside strategy. I think that's absolutely crucial. So the existence of their... Oh, I think we need to do both as well. But when I say that, people have a meltdown. You're going to weaken the Democrats if you support third party. Even though you're in a state that is going to go Democrat no matter what. You got to do both. It ain't that hard. We need to take over the Democrat Party, but we also need to implement reform so third parties have a chance. Both things need to be bun. It's not one or yeah. the other. Third parties, even if they can't necessarily win power, I do think they are important pressure points on individuals from the inside, including AOC. That's great. So, but I mean, what I'm speaking to here is really the opportunism that I'm seeing and the unseriousness of the People's Party. Because if I'm a third party, like if I'm control, in control of the People's Party, and this isn't just like some party to exert outside pressure on insiders, and we actually want to run candidates, field candidates, and win, and actually get power, Here's what is going to be my number one priority. And I talked about this in the video where I covered the people's party. Electoral reform. It's extremely yep. frustrating to me because for years, I've said to people, if you want a third party, you need electoral reform because we have a first past the post, winner take all majoritarian system. It's due for Jay's law. It always holds. And if we were going to break up the two party duopoly by force and without getting electoral reform, it would have happened in 2016. Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, but it still didn't happen. Just found out like barely 1% of the vote. So if you want a third party to actually get power because you believe the Democratic Party is not able, uh, capable of change, okay, that may be a valid point, but you need electoral reform. You can't just say, fuck the squad, support the people's party. If you have no plan whatsoever to change the electoral system. And ranked choice voting is a very easy thing to do that. Uh, it would help, it wouldn't necessarily get us you know, uh, multiple parties, but you have to understand that there are actual bills, and, and unfortunately Don Byers hasn't reintroduced this, but there's a fair representation act. It was HR 4000 in the 2019-2020 legislative session. And this would actually move us closer toward proportional representation. And the people on the left who are really adamant about going the third party route said nothing about this. And I begged people to support electoral reform. I want us to be a multi-party system. And that's difficult when you have a presidential and a parliamentary system like Canada has. But we can't do that just by having an extra party because there are already hundreds of third parties in the United States. But this issue has become so contentious because people are rightfully angry at the Democratic Party, feeling perhaps justifiably so that it won't be reformed or can't be reformed, that anyone who dares to run in the Democratic Party, they're not worth a damn. And hence the reason why Nina Turner has been disregarded by many people. But the problem with that is if you just have one extra party to add to the hundreds of third parties that already exist, you're not doing much. And the way that we actually enact change is by having power. And so unfortunately, opportunistic individuals, they're leading people towards this path of perpetual anger and disempowerment. The People's Party might end up putting electoral reform on their agenda. They might put pressure on Don Myers to reintroduce the Fair Representation Act. Perhaps they even pressure AOC, which would be an incredible idea, to support the Fair Representation Act because she didn't co-sponsor that legislation, which I think she should support because it's good legislation. But they're not doing that right now. So at this state, if the People's Party simply runs candidates just in addition to the Republican and the Democrat, well, unless you're in a state like California, where you have a jungle primary system, where you have the top two vote-getters make it to the general election, you're not going to get anyone elected. So really what we have to do as leftists is build power, not disempower ourselves. But if we are constantly attacking the only allies we have in Congress, putting them in no-win position, where regardless of what they do, show up or don't show up to our marches, we still show them we're in a constant state of disempowerment, and we are absolutely serving the corporate Democratic Party who wants the left to be divided. We have basically divided ourselves into oblivion, to where the online left is now unrecognizable. And again, thankfully, this is all very insular, and a lot of people don't recognize what's happening on Twitter. But what we're doing here is we are killing ourselves by dividing ourselves and even questioning one another, where every little thing we do or don't do is uh, irredeemable. So getting back to me like getting called out for not talking about the Medicare for All March. I did talk about it. I brought on one of the organizers. It was on the first episode of Dystopian Times, one of the first segments that I released for Dystopian Times. And I talked about it. And I uploaded that as a segment. It was like over 10 minutes long. I mean, talked about the necessity of healthcare. But people who don't even watch anymore, which is which is fine, preferable if you're a cancerous individual because I don't want you in my audience to be toxic, but they, they are already like attacking me because I didn't talk about something I already talked about. And if I do talk about it, then it's like, well, you didn't talk about it enough. We put each other in no-win situations. And this is not about me, but you I'm just ignore them. Or, you know, people online will say something and it's like, oh, well, you know what? You must be a CIA plant. You must be an operative for the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. And we're so suspicious of people. We're so um, angry at our own peers who have the same goals as us that I just have to tell people, stop, take a deep breath. Let's all chill. Let's all recalibrate. Let's all go outside and touch grass. And whenever we get to a point to where we are in a constant state of anger, where people are, you know, attacking one another and driving more of a wedge between the online left that already exists. Stop. Don't participate in it. Um, I took the week off from uh, my show last week, and um, I felt really good. It was good for like my mental health. Um, and then immediately, like coming back, I log on to Twitter, and it's like, 
oh, I feel depressed and hopeless again because there's nothing but like hatred and vitriol online. And again, part of this is that like getting the used to vacuum, it. the leadership vacuum left open by Bernie, you know, after his campaign, people who are nefarious or perhaps not even nefarious, just opportunistic people seized on that leadership vacuum. They try to take up the mantle and it's, it's literally exactly what like the right wants and the corporate Democrats want, us fighting each other and like giving Joe Manchin and Joe Biden a pass. Folks, we seem unreasonable. If you log on to Twitter, people seem unhinged. People are attacking their allies for dumb reasons. Vote shaming when I thought the leftists don't like that. Where it's like, oh, you supported Joe Biden, so like you're literally a war criminal. I mean, imagine if somebody who wasn't terminally online saw the discourse that takes place on Twitter. They would rightfully think that we're batshit fucking insane because that's the way that we've seen. So I don't really care if this pisses people off. It needs to be said, chill out, stop feeding into the anger, stop inviting, stop being accusatory of anyone who dares to vocalize any disagreement with you whatsoever, calm down, recalibrate, and recognize who the real enemies are. While we fight each other, corporate Democrats, like Joe Manchin and Jason Sinema, they get a pass. They get to block voting rights that would actually help democracy as Republicans try to kill it. Republicans get a pass as they literally spiral further into delusions and become more conspiratorial, more uh, anti-vax. We have to calm down and, and stop fighting each other, each other over every fucking thing, for the love of God. Just breathe, recalibrate, we center yourself. And remember that every once in a while, being angry, which is justifiable, it can lead us to a prolonged state of irrationality, which is not healthy, which gets us away from the trajectory that we should be on. It moves us away from our goals. And every once in a while, if we log off, remind ourselves why we're even talking about politics because we care about these issues, then that will be, uh, it'll be better. It'll be better for all of us, better for the movement. But for me to even say this, um, people will assume I'm like in some camp online. Um, I'm a TYT sellout who is like um, getting my marching orders from Jenka. I've heard that too. People, for the love of God, we have to stop doing this. We have. I've been called a door stand for like criticizing Vosh's um stuff on Force to Vote. I don't even really watch him. That was pretty funny. <laughs> wow. <laughs> have to stop with the drama Not and the infighting. The people who want this to go on aren't doing it because it's actually beneficial for the left. They're doing it because it's beneficial for themselves, for their pockets. And I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to feed into that so I can start a new wave of drama. I'm not going to do that. But what I am saying is that individually, you as a viewer, as a Twitter user, which I hope not, can make the decision unilaterally to try to do better. I've certainly tried. I've tried to log off and use Twitter less. I've tried to not engage in infighting. And when I see somebody who I disagree with, I try to like engage with them in good faith and explain to them why I don't agree with their position. And sometimes, you know, they'll move them to my side. Other times they'll like immediately shit themselves and start running in the mouth because they don't want to hear anything that I'm saying. All the times I criticize and say let this on Twitter, they immediately just call me all the isms and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine, you can't reach everyone, but the best thing you can do is police ourselves isms. in a way and make sure that what we're contributing to political discourse isn't actually a net negative, rather it's, it's a positive. So um, look, it's not like I'm above the fray, I'm, I'm guilty of inviting too, but every once in a while we have to recenter ourselves and recalibrate and breathe. Let's breathe. And again, touching grass can do wonders. Better idea, play games! <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, what do you have to say about this topic? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, like, we just not fight so much and just be very careful with what we do. Yeah, focus on. We gotta get progressives in power. How would. I still can't imagine how on earth anyone would not want Nina Turner to win. She is awesome. Do you want her cr that crazy bitch that she's run against to win? She's pretty much a Republican, for God's sake. Being a dino. We can't have her in there. We gotta get. We gotta make sure she stays out. Nina would be fucking know. awesome, for God's sake. And then, of course, like, what's your experience dealing with, like, um, leftists online and all that? Uh, a little better. Um, but, unfortunately, there's still a fair bit of infighting. I think I might want to talk about that in the future, about my problems with, like, people on the left. Because a lot of them are just really, really dumb. I mean, we talked about them earlier with, like, the um, context of slurs, but a lot of them just are really cringy and dumb a lot of times. Like the fact yeah. that, oh, I am basically Hitler for not for not voting for Biden, remember? <laughs> oh, God. I mean, like, um, um, Mike brought up too about, oh, if I voted for Biden, therefore I'm like a, um, support, like, um, imperialism and all that. No, but at the same time, you are def in defending it too by voting for him especially when you're in a state that he was going to win no matter what so you kind of are responsible for that if you vote uh, for him and he I does that question. um okay i'm gonna actually ask this for you if you lived in say pennsylvania would you have voted biden no okay okay so there's one that so there is a point we partly disagree on so now what I, do you I, so what do you I, I understand why though i do partially disagree i think that um if it's one where if it's a swing state that you've got to get to um thing 
you you do yeah and then you're like all right but down we got the best ones you're good you're good you're good you're good and i hate having to put biden in i am in say pennsylvania <laughs> if they're progressive democrats brandon pennsylvania i'd vote for them but not him and, of course, my vote would have no effect since he won it by a couple hundred thousand votes. <laughs> you know what I mean, though? Like, you know what I'm getting at, though? Like, you do, do it, like, maybe you specifically, but that trip, but the mindset, yeah, it works for a state you're safe in. You do need to, you got to be a little bit more nuanced with it if you're in... A swing state, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, etc. It's the, I guess it's more the mindset that I'm a little thing on. That's like, like I can, that's like it. I can understand it, but that's the same, um, That's the thing people always told me. Oh, oh, if you don't vote for Biden in your state, everyone's gonna vote for Trump, and Trump's gonna win Maryland. No. My individual vote is not going to make any sort of difference, nor is it going to influence anyone's opinion on who to vote for. I tell people to vote who they vote for, and most people fucking despise Trump. So they're going to just hold their nose and probably vote for Biden, which the majority did. I don't think me not voting for him is going to make any sort of difference to it. But at least you're not going to call me fucking Hitler for not um, voting for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but like, you get my um, thing about, about um, the general mindset. That you do need to have a little bit of nuance when it comes to close swing states. Yeah, but I where, agree. Where, like, a couple hundred thousand votes, if that in... Let me check something. Because I know in Pennsylvania wound up getting a fair margin. A couple um, hundred thousand. Ah, there's the big one. A big one. Um... Just 20,000 points would be enough for, uh, would have been enough to flip Wisconsin. Uh, I think Michigan might be a similar one. Oh, Georgia's even more because Georgia, that was 11. Georgia and Virginia are like 11,000 each or something like that. <laughs> Not Georgia and Arizona. They were the closest, I think. Yeah, that Arizona was actually the one where um, Trump almost came back. Yeah. Yeah, that was 10,000. Yeah, and, that, was, um, that was the one he did in, not contest, remember? Um, 11,000 in Georgia. So those ones where that mindset with um, not voting for Biden no matter what could have actually cost two states. But the individual person is not going to affect the outcome, which people kept insisting, yes, it would affect that. Like, yeah, even if I... Yeah, even I if I, I'm more talking about... Um, Talking about um, the more uh, more general trend of the that mindset could cause thing if um, it's too if it's um, too prevalent. I don't think it's, I don't think it's any in really close states like Arizona, Wisconsin. Actually, this was the one I was going to check. Michigan. How Mich close was Michigan? I think it was like over 100,000. Oh, okay. Yeah, that one had a 3% difference. Okay. Maybe not so much in um, Michigan, but like I said, you said a minute, Arizona, Georgia. Those are the closest, I think. They were. But like my problem, of course, was, oh, you are... Hitler, if you don't vote for him, even though in your state that literally has no impact whatsoever. That was like non-stop, especially in Bosch's community too, and I'm fucking sick and tired of it. And yes. not really, I don't, I would not vote for him in a swing state because in the end, even if I did vote for him, he still was going to win no matter what. My one vote ain't going to make a difference, and I don't think my mindset is anywhere near as prevalent as people think it is. Like, God, look at like third parties and on um, vote turnout. The vote, I mean, third party vote went down and the turnout went up massively. People just went out because Trump was just so bad, he got people to vote for Biden even though they don't want, like him. So, yeah. like, people can't ever just accept that people like, especially like me, in deep blue states, our vote literally has no meat value, so why shame us for not voting for a piece of shit like Biden? But no, they never saw that. They And they genuinely came across me like they really thought, they really... Something. 
The Libertarian vote costs Trump Arizona. I. The Libertarian vote costs Trump Arizona. And how much? Biden did... won by eleven by ten thousand votes. The Libertarian candidate got fifty. The Green and the other parties only got about sixteen hundred. Only got not even sixteen hundred. But I would I wouldn't blame the Libertarians for that. That was more if Trump was just so bad that people voted for Libertarians instead of him. Just like remember, people blamed Green Party for Hillary losing. Remember that? And I debunked that mathematically years now, ago. If we blocked up that, it wouldn't have made any difference. And if that happened in any other states. And even if they did flip Arizona, Biden still would have won. Even if they, even yeah, Trump took Georgia. A couple of the others. But we're getting like really off topic. Georgia, we, yeah, Georgia. I wonder, wonder if any other big ones like Michigan or PA. No, no Michigan. Wisconsin. That one was close. Yep, Wisconsin. Oh, was well, Wisconsin. PA. Oh. Maybe. They would have put it to four. Oh, that would have gone either way with PA. Nah, um, not quite. Not quite. It would have been really close, but um, most of the Trump vote, most of the, a lot of the Libertarian votes going for Trump would have almost flipped the election. It wouldn't have been quite enough. But it would have been really, really close. All right, so I think it's time we get on to the next topic. Yep. This is about states banning gaming PCs. This I found out just recently from Review Tech USA. Supposedly, a bunch of states on the West Coast have implemented policies several years ago, like back in 2016, that was supposed to lower like energy consumption of like appliances and all of them. And just recently, these states did them for game gaming PCs. And of Why? course, well, we're getting that. And it caused a big concern because, like, Dell, with their Alienware, said we're no longer making, I'm shipping our Alienwares to California because of the, um, um, regulations. So, of course, it caused this massive scare that they're going to prevent people from being able to have, um, build and buy gaming PCs in these states. And that's a, that, that, of course, would be very bad because a lot of people do that shit, like me. And, of course, in the end of it, too... Even if they do produce me, I'm take a lot of energy. It is nowhere, nowhere near other um, causes of energy usage. Oh my God! There are many, many worse, worse things that uh, consume more energy and cause more damage to the environment than fucking PC gaming. PC gaming is like nothing, nothing in comparison to other things. And if you, oh, I don't know, maybe banned. Um, gas running cars and start encouraging electrical ones that would have a massive help on the environment or how about encourage green energy and shut down like all fossil fuel plants and stuff like that that would really help or I don't know go after like the corporations that pollute more like was like seven like seven corporations or whatever produce like 70% of the world like America's emissions or something like that remember Kyle covered it before something like that no I remember that See, so yeah, it's so stupid. But there was one topic, I mean, one site I found that actually talked about it had supposedly a little bit more nuance to it. I don't know if you want to necessarily believe this or it um, might help calm people down. It's possible what they're talking about is not PC games, I mean, P gaming PCs in themselves. It's more of them being like in sleep mode or hibernate mode. Because when they're, because ah. well, when they're in sleep in hibernate mode, they don't take that much wattage. I even the guy who made my um desk my desktop, who's really smart with computers, I think he said even at most, if a computer's in sleep mode, it might only take like one watt an hour or something like that, which is still like nothing, absolutely Ooh. nothing. So I, I really don't know what to say about this. And this guy, the way he described it. He made it sound like this would not actually affect gaming PCs. This would might affect, like, low-end computers instead. Oh. That's really huh. weird. So, hmm. what do you guys say about this? That sounds, sounds a bit weird. weird. This whole thing sounds <laughs> weird. And, of course, hmm. I'm sure it also doesn't help that the policymakers in these states don't explain it well. So that causes the issue of people being concerned about being PC, gaming PCs, which... 
Not even fully yep. sure if that's the case or not, because there's like conflicting info on it. But yeah. they did a very bad job. So we gotta see about this in itself. It's so oh, it's weird. It, it is. I'm not sure, quite sure what to make of it personally. It's well, just... let's let's say hypothetically it is banning on um, sales of um gaming PCs in these states. Well, that's fucking stupid. Yeah, that's, that would be absolutely fucking stupid. Especially since it not has any effect on the environment whatsoever compared to other things. Anything else you want to say about it? Not really. So, it really is too hope, much else to say. Especially since we don't know much about it. Hopefully, they don't actually ban gaming PCs in these states. It was California, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, and I think Vermont. So, yeah. hopefully that won't be the case. So now I think it's time to get on to the final video, which, oh god, we're gonna go back in the middle of the 2010s in the anti-SJW phase. As of course, here we go. <laughs> remember earlier when we were watching that Hunter Avalon video, well because I, I saw that video, I started to get a lot more of Hunter's videos lately, and I came across a video where he was making fun of this video called 20 questions black people have for white people that BuzzFeed didn't ask. Okay, so it's not BuzzFeed, it's your black world. And it's from 2016, God. and of course, it's like all the SJW, like, hardcore, like, race bait and bullshit that you could think of. That even made Hunter seem reasonable in comparison back even then. So... Lord, that's saying something. Yeah. This is going to be really weird because... Sometimes they're right on a lot of stuff, but a lot of ways they say it in such bad ways they come across as racist against whites. So, That's, let's I, begin this. I feel like quite a few of these questions we're going to be, um... Nuanced and agree. Like, um, rewording them. Yeah. Uh, to... Because some, some, some of the things they talk about are fair, but the way they describe it is, like, absolutely the worst way you can go at it. It's bad fight. Be honest, you hate black people, don't you? Here we go, right off the bat! <laughs> right off the bat, accusations of racism. Exactly. N well, here's the problem. You're describing, like, an individual thing to individual people, which, of course, no, I don't hate blacks. Why do you assume that? Do you hate whites? Are you the racist one? And they're taking Probably. these and they're taking these questions and they really do come across like they're trying to collectivize it to all whites. Don't you get that impression? Because I most certainly do. And I'm someone who uh, hey, I reckon it, I reckon that's what I'm gonna find by the end. I think I've seen a couple of these sort of videos and they are Yeah. And I'm more like on their side on this stuff, but you guys just phrase it along like, why would you say something that dumb to start off with? You hate black like, don't you? Fucking dumbass. White people, do you know what gentrification is doing to black neighborhoods? Do you have any idea? Oh boy, let's get what? that. What? What is doing to black Gentr communities? Gentrification. Oh, gentrification. Right. So anything you want to talk uh. about that? Maybe you know about it better than me. Don't think I can describe it really well. Hold on. Basically, uh, as it's, the process, it's the process whereby the character of a poor urban area is changed by wealthier people moving in, improving housing and attracting new businesses, often displacing current inhabitants in the process. Yeah, so basically, like a poor area in the city or something like that, wealthy people would come in, fix all the stuff up, make it like ex help wealthy and all that, but in the process, it kicks out like the poor people in this area, which usually are often blacks. So... Yeah. I'll say that... um. It is a, I'd say this gentrification is probably more class than race yeah. when it comes to things. And this is actually, more... and this one is actually very controversial, but I support it in terms of bringing, making these places better and not poor, but I don't want to kick them out either. Like, I want, like, both. What do you guys say? Yeah, I would say... Agreed. But when I bring that. that, even when I say it in that like nuanced way, oh god, leftists have a meltdown and call me every single ism in the book for it, and I find it hard to believe. When I still agree with them on the same principle that it's not good in terms of kicking them out. Like, what the fuck is wrong with these people? A lot of times, does it seem like a lot of times to you that they just want to say the isms? Like, they just, like, like, yeah, they, just just, they just want to be an NPC ism machine. 
I lob it to his voice for later too. <laughs> Why is being a former drug dealer a bad thing, but being a former slave owner totally okay in white America? Okay, here we go with this one now too. I'm sure if you told me to ask most white people about slave owners, they probably would most likely be against them because most people in America, well not most, a big majority of them are anti-racist. So I mean, it's kind of weird to assume that we all think that slave owners are awesome. And I think I might know maybe more what they're getting at. I think they're not talking about like slave owners. I think they might be talking more about like the founding fathers. If Possibly. You well, if that is indeed what you're talking about, this is another problem I've noticed too of like leftists when it comes to the founding fathers. They do like the reverse of like conservatives do when it comes to the founding fathers. Like the founding fathers, I mean the conservatives just venerate the founding fathers that they never did anything wrong ever. These guys on the left act like they've done nothing but bad. Haven't you noticed that feeling too? Yeah, I've got that feeling as well. It's um... <laughs> A really weird thing. Yeah, and I, yeah, they've done some good things. They did some bad things. This is what I've experienced you too. Know, the bad things and uh, cheer them on the good things. Like this it's is another, not a it's not a zero sum game. This is another thing I experienced too. I've left this when I talk about this. Yes, a lot of the founding fathers had slaves, but a lot of them didn't, and a lot of them were against them. Like Ben Franklin, like the biggest advocate for for um, abolitionism. So not all founding fathers had slaves or support slavery. And another thing is, so a lot of them did try to remove it, but a, they really couldn't in a lot of ways because remember, a lot of them wanted slavery still in the Constitution. That's another thing about the Constitution. Uh, the contradiction of all men are created equal, but slavery's still there. Yeah, that is a contradiction and it shouldn't have been there. But at the same time, they the, peop, the abolitionists really didn't have much of a choice because they were the minority and if they refused it, it probably the Constitution probably wouldn't have been passed whatsoever, and the country might have, for I know, fallen apart maybe. And the founding fathers, yeah, a lot of them were racist and have slaves, but they also helped build the country. You have to also recognize that too. They were as cringy and weird as they say they were the liberals for their times. Like that's something you gotta also recognize too. Uh, uh, actually, that might be kind of fitting that um, in the uh, centrist liberal view. Yeah. <laughs> And, and then another thing, too, that always brings me up about the slave thing, too. Like, the Civil War. Like, especially Robert E. Lee, if you don't know him, one of the Confederate generals. Yes. This one also annoys me, too, because they... People like these people act like um, he is nothing but bad. Like, there's nothing irredeemable about him because he was a racist piece of shit and he was a traitor. Yeah, all that's true. But he also still was one of the most competent generals in the Civil War. He single-handedly kept the, the um, South alive for years. The Civil War should not have lasted that long. It's because of people like him being a military genius, unlike the idiot generals the Union have, that kept the Civil War lasting for four years. And if it wasn't for a single fuck-up, the Confederacy might have actually won the Civil War, if you don't know about that one. Yeah. In um, 1862, E. Lee had a plan where he was going to Move up to Pennsylvania. This is like what led up to the second try of Gettysburg in 1863, but they were going to do a plan, like sneak up through Pennsylvania, go down through Baltimore, tack down there, and maybe seize D.C., which was undefended at the time. They had to get past the um, tr Union troops in like Pennsylvania. That was the oh, plan, wow. but unfortunately for the Confederacy, good thing for America, the plans were held by a Confederate troop who ended up dropping it and it was later found by the Union forces who used it to counter the attack in 1862. <laughs> That's how close it was. And if they succeed oh, in that, wow. and if they succeed with that, the British and French might have intervened to prevent the end of civil war and have the South secede completely. That's how close we were. As wow. backwards as hell as the South was compared to the North, they almost had a chance to win it because of people being as smart as Elite. And a lot of times leftists, in my experience, just refuse to acknowledge that. Yeah, he was a piece of shit, but he still was a very smart general. It's the loss of um, nuance. Nuance again. And I'm going to use a Star Wars analogy here. Um, Robert E. Lee, in some ways, kind of sounds like Grand Admiral Thrawn, where, yeah, Thrawn's done some pretty terrible things. 
But he is also the single greatest gen um, admiral in the history of Star Wars. Hell, Admiral Akbar used one used in a battle not long after Thrawn's attack. He used the Thrawn pincer against the Empire to devastating effect. But you guys gotta have some nuance to it. It's not all one bad, one good, and all that. Yeah, point yeah. out the point out the contradictions of the Founding Fathers. Point out how bad Ely was and all that. But you have to also recognize the things that not necessarily they're good at, but what they're influential in at least. Yeah. Do you honestly think the structure of America is not based on racism? Systemic racism does exist, but sometimes I get the feeling that they're trying to imply that America was only founded and built upon like racism, which I think is a little bit of a stretch. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think, think it's a, it's probably a little hard to s overboard. Um, yeah, slavery. There's yeah, other bits to it, like yeah, racism, racism was a big part of it, but not solely the reason. Yeah, because that was like the 1619 Project, remember? Oh, good, yes. Yeah, oh, America was racist, yeah. Slavery, yeah, bad, all that. It wasn't the sole thing that America is based upon. And of course, yeah, systemic racism still exists and we need to fight that. At least I'll acknowledge that. Do you really think you discovered America? Do you really think it's yours? <laughs> well, here we go. In co individualizing, in collectivizing something to an individual. First off, no, Columbus didn't discover America. It was the Vikings that did 500 years yeah. before Columbus. That's something that is not well known because it was never documented and the Vikings were pretty much gone after that. Now, of course, Columbus yeah. discovering America was influential to the world since now Europe knew about it because beforehand, even though the Vikings covered it, the rest of Europe didn't know about it. So it was a very big influential thing because, yeah, they didn't know about America at the time. And, yeah, it wasn't our land and we stole it from the Native Americans and we genocide them and it was all pure awful. But at the same time, now... You're fucking yeah right, this is my home and this is a lot of our homes. We think we're gonna do leave and give it back to the Native Americans? Hell no, this is my home as much as it is theirs used to be, for God's sake. Like a lot I have seen a lot of these people really do tell like whites that they need to like leave the country, give back the land to Native Americans. Like, no. Oh, this is my home now too. Just because what we did to Native Americans was wrong doesn't mean we have to have the same thing happen to us. The only thing you can do is just fix what we did in the past. By, like, helping build up the Native American community. Because there's a lot of problems that America screwed over with the Native American community. And it still happened to this day. Yeah. Is there anything you got to say about this one? Pretty... Yeah. You, it, nuance is really important here. It's really important on a lot of this stuff. When I'm upset, I'm an angry black man. Or a black woman. But when you're upset, you're just upset. Aren't you an angry white man? Yeah, this one I've seen, unfortunately, way too often. Yeah, that one seems unfortunately true. If blacks are angry, they're just angry black men. If I'm angry, no one treats it like a bad thing or anything. Have you seen that too? Because I most certainly have. Yes. That's the one thing so far we 100% agree with him on. Why isn't racism illegal? <laughs> uh, it is illegal in terms of, uh, you know, civil rights. Like, mm -hmm. businesses can't stop, can't sell people, I mean, sell stuff to blacks because they're black they that's illegal so yeah racism in terms of like um businesses that is illegal but i think what they mean by is illegal in terms of like free speech like doesn't that come across to you as well yeah, yeah. I'd like say so. like they want to like have like hate speech laws and all that. and look yeah if someone says like racist shit i hate n-words yeah they're racist and they're cringy and guess what you can use your free speech rights to call them a racist piece of shit and all that but guess what it's free speech as long as they're not like actively advocating violence or anything like that if they just say i hate n-words okay that's wrong but they need to be allowed to say it it is free speech and you can use your free speech rights to criticize them that's how it works yep yep why is gaining the black vote so important, but mass incarceration against black people isn't? Because mostly Democrats only use that to get the black vote out to help them since they get the vast majority of black votes. Remember, like 90%. They don't really, most of them don't really care or they don't try to fight to get um, 
end mass incarceration. Of course, you have the Republicans who don't give a fuck about any of you. That's just, more, just, a lot of them just, just want to kill, kill people, people, kill black people. That's a criticism of Democrats I bring up all the time, but of course, Vosh and all of them have a meltdown when I do that. Yeah. <laughs> if you criticize them, you're helping Republicans. Uh, fucking idiots. You were, saying, you were saying something? Oh no, I was just yawning. Why are all of y'all afraid of black people? Oh my god, here we go again. Just like earlier, you hey, now we're afraid of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, see what, see what I mean, guys? Stop all white people for the actions of a few every negativist in the book morons. Again, individual collectivizing something into an individual person. I am not afraid of you. Dude, I grew up in Baltimore County. It's 60% black, for God's sake. When I, at one point, I'm not kidding not for a few years, when I was like, mid-2000s, me and my parents were the only white family in my street, for God's sake. That's how black my area was. When I went to school, it was vast majority black. Like, in my class, it would be like, 20 kids? I'd be like, one of like, four, maybe five whites? My best friends in school wow. were all black, pretty much. I was the only white boy in that regard. So, yeah, I'm not afraid being around Come you. On. Come on. <laughs> nice. I get, if anything, like, again, I have to ask earlier the way you phrase it. Are you? Do you hate white people? Are you afraid of us? Probably. Are you the racist one? Hmm. It sure, comes across, it sure comes across that way to me. I don't want yeah, your like purse. I, said, I just want to sign the same pay rate. What are you going to do about systematic racism? Point it out and vote for politicians that want to fight for it, which of course yeah. I'll, I'm, which oh, against systemic racism. You mean? Yep. And of course, I'm sure a lot of you probably. Oh, mm, I don't know. Maybe did not vote for. Oh, I don't know. Bernie. You probably vote for Hillary or Biden in, in the um, primaries. Who actively both of them supported the um, the crime bill, which actively harmed you guys. So. Yep. I'm sure that happened to a lot of you guys because you care more about your identity politics instead of policies. So I definitely would probably trust my um, support of fighting systemic racism over you guys. Especially the way you've been going. You've actively made it worse. I mean, you... Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, emphasizing you specifically. <laughs> Why must yeah. you own all the media outlets? I mean, could we at least have BET back? Okay, well... Here's something I don't think a lot of people understand, too. America is majority white. It's like 70%. Couldn't it be a reasonable thought that since the majority of Americans are white, that media outlets are mostly owned by whites? Like, wouldn't that make yep. a little bit of a reason? Like, in African countries, they're, like, almost all black. It would make sense for them to be all, all black on the media outlets because that's the demographics. Now, of course, I support um, more in more inclusivity and all that, but the way you go about it, you're making a big deal about something that probably, in the grand scheme of things, is not really that big of a deal. If whites are the major own the majority of media outlets, as long as they're not doing like illegal stuff or got their like bad ways, it's really not that big of a deal. Just and, that, and it, just like um, people like make a big deal about like, Ugh, women are not in like the um. CEO positions are a lot. It's just um, patriarchy and all that. A lot of women just yeah. don't want to do those jobs and they're not many of them that are qualified. So is it really sexism that's caused it or is it just women just don't want to do those things? Again, yeah. no odds. Why does every race qualify for reparations except black people? The only people that have gotten reparations that I know of in America were Native Americans and the Japanese. I don't know of anyone else that's gotten reparations in America. What about you down there? Did anyone get reparations down there? Uh, I don't know about... Oh, no, we're still having problems with it. We're still... Um, uh, we sort of do. It's more a, um individual thing with the stolen generation. So, yeah, when it, well, when it comes to, like... um. Reparations, what do you think about it? Because I don't really support it in the way that they probably uh, want it. Not directly. Yeah. Um, like, well, like yeah. instead of, instead of like, directly getting white people to pay black people, instead what you do is if a black person wants to put, start a business, 
they get tax breaks for say the first three years or something yeah. until their business is properly established. Yeah, this is another problem with leftists too. I experience when they keep insistent and insistent and insistent on reparations. There's many nuanced reasons why not to support. One, I'm not even sure if that would even work, like in the way they want. They really do want to be like just give blacks money. I don't think that would yeah. be really the most viable thing ever. I don't necessarily trust people with a lot of them if you give them a lot of money. I wouldn't be surprised if you just blow it all on, like, one thing or whatever, and that's it. It'd be nothing. Instead of, you know, use it to, like, help them out, basically. Two, I... How... Two is, how are you going to even give it to them? Like, how are you going to do it? Like, the um reparations yeah. for Japanese Americans after the internment back in the 80s. Like, the one good thing Reagan did. It The reparation payments only went to people that were still alive when that, that were in the internment. So only like 20,000 people got out of like 120,000 people. Only them got. So if this is going to go to people that are directly descendants of slaves, how are you going to full determine that? Because most of them yeah. are dead. I mean, well, first off, all of them are dead, so it wouldn't even be possible since, remember, if based upon the Japanese version, only people that were in the internments got reparations, not like their families afterwards or any of that. So literally, by that example, no one would get money in because they're all dead. But how are you going to, if you're going to give it to the um, descendants, how are you going to confirm that they were indeed descendants of slaves? Because a lot of their records, of course, were never saved or anything. So that would be very difficult to consider. I don't, and also, it's going to cause like anti white backlash. And I don't think it's worth it enough to have to deal with that crap. And, yep. I, and I, I think I already said it probably wouldn't really work. What would work instead is what you said and fixing education. Doing some forms of gentrification instead of kicking them out and stuff like that. Do economic reforms, education reforms instead of just hand them money and all that. Yeah. A long time ago. Yeah. Really not that long ago. You guys prevented black people from learning how to read and write. But why did you let them keep the Bible? I know this exactly because I studied the Civil War. Um, Southern plantation owners gave um, their slaves the Bible and they kept them illiterate and they only taught them about the parts of the Bible that justified slavery so they can be subjugated and accept their place as being slaves. That's yeah. why. That's it. Yep. Yeah. That's literally it. Yeah. And I don't know why you even bring it up. Yeah, they did that. It's a bad thing, but why are you bringing up like, like what's the point? White people, historically, you've never liked black people. But why have you always accepted black people's money? Oh my god, here we go again, saying we all hate whites again. Oh my fucking god. Well, not all of them did remember. That's why we had to have the civil rights so blacks, you know, business were forced to accept black people's money if they wanted to um, do business with them. And of course, most corporations, all of them, they don't care about your background. All they care about is your money. And this is a lot of thing. It's not really much with leftists. It's more like liberals that are like supportive of woke capitalism. Guys, they don't give a fuck about you. They literally don't care about you. All they care about is your money. And I guarantee you this. If corporations can get literally one more penny out of being all the isms, even with all the backlash they would get, if they still get one more penny out of, the, out of it at the end of the day, they're going to be all the isms because they want that extra penny. They not, yeah. They're not our allies. All they care about is money. That's it. Yeah. What does colonization mean to you? Taking over um, pay, pay native people's lands and subjugating them. And of course, when it came to Na Native Americans, outright killing them. Yep. I'm pretty sure. Oh my God. These are probably, these are probably going to be the people obsess obsessed about colonization, everything, and bring up colonizer like in every single thing. Like remember the video Kyle did a few months ago about this? Yeah, I think so. Oh my God! These probably, these people would probably think like literally everything like an anti-colonialist mindset instead of saying like the right things but use the different terms that that really turns people off. Yeah, colonization is bad, but don't bring it up like in literally every single thing when there's other ways you can describe it. You do know crack and cocaine are both drugs, right? Can you find out why Bill Clinton thinks one should carry a harsher sentence than the other? Uh, because he was racist? Uh, yep, because, he's a, because he was a dino. Because he wanted to do Republican policies? Which, by the way, yep. Biden supported, which I'm sure a lot of you guys voted for, too. So you indirectly are in support of it, too? Hmm. 
That's why. Because they probably were racist. How about this? Make drugs legal. How about that idea? Let's make drugs legal and end all the um, nonviolent drug offenses and release everyone. Now this one is for Flint. When are you going to arrest Governor Snyder? Well, this video was done in 2016, which wasn't the case. But right now, as of 2021, he's not arrested when I last checked this the other day. But he is facing charges right now, so it looks like you are going to hopefully get that way eventually. And yeah, you're right. He should have been. The, how Flint was handled was just awful. That's one thing we agree 100% on again with them. Why wasn't he arrested? Why did it take yeah. so damn long? So when we talk about slavery, why are you uncomfortable? It's part of American history. What? I'm not offended by it, but I kind of am a little bit offended by both conservatives downplaying it and whitewashing it, and then you guys making it like it's like it's literally like every single thing about America. Maybe you guys are wrong on both ends. Again, it, nuance. Yeah, America did have slavery, and of course, conservatives are a bunch of fucking idiots and probably racist too to downplay. It. Look, do you remember? The, I think Kyle covered that they were um some idiot on Fox literally said there was no America never had slavery. <laughs> I think that guy was black too to make it even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Tom and its finest. <laughs> but, yeah, these guys are insane, but yeah, you guys are correct to point that America had a, a lot of problems with slavery. It was a very big important thing, but you guys make it out like it's the only thing that is important. It's not. It's not the only important thing. And you guys are honestly in a lot of ways overestimating it too oh my god point out that's bad but don't make it out like it's the literally like the only thing like you guys really do come across to me as you talk about why do you want to adopt the fun part of black culture but not the true lifestyle of black american the fuck is this even supposed to mean do you even know no what culture are you talking about I, know. I mean, if anything, I would, that would, a, a criticism, that accusation would apply more to me if I was with um, Japanese since I watch anime and play their games a lot. I don't know what black culture you're talking about. I gotta know, why do you wear shorts in the wintertime? Because people uh, my want brother. to? Um, I, I, if my brother does that. Uh, I guess yeah, this might be more accurate for me if um, they were to ask, why do you wear, um, why do you wear jeans in the summertime? And I'm like, because I don't like wearing shorts. Same here. I wear pants every time, no matter where I go. Even if it's like 100 degrees, I'll wear fucking black pants too. I don't care. It don't bug me. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but first off, even regardless of the question, why are you insinuating that this is like a white people's thing? You do know whites are not the only wear the only people that wear shorts, right? Like, like what the fuck? What is this even a qu question about? Why is it a big deal if people white or not want to wear shorts in the winter? If that's what they want to wear, go right ahead. Maybe they're not bugged by winter like you guys are. Like, like what kind of a question is this? And thank God that cringe is over. Jesus. Right, that was Finally. that was now there was like two or three things that we were agree we agree with 100 percent with them on and other things we did agree upon but of course the way to describe it was very very bad like really bad like i don't know if you guys mean it or not but a lot of ways you do come across as racist to us even though we're progressive like, you really guys do come across, like we said earlier, that just want to blame whites for literally every single thing. And guess what, guys? You're racist if you do that. And I don't want to hear none of this, uh, privilege plus power. No, 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 no. If you, if you have prejudiced views against whites, it doesn't matter if you are even capable of implementing it. It's still racist. End of discussion. Yep. Anything you want to say about this? It's like, God, this was bad. Yeah, like, there are some of these where you can't even... The funny thing... Where you could rephrase it and it would be a lot better. Hell yeah. But... I there mean, are some where you just never could. 
I mean, a lot of that stuff we probably would agree with completely if they just phrase it differently like we did in the video. Like, come on, guys. You're almost there. You just need to phrase it correctly instead of doing all your woke points, which a lot of you guys do, even though, oh my god, every time I call people woke tards, leftists out online have a meltdown about that too, but can you really compl complain about me when we just saw this video? Like, come on. Like, this was just so bad. How can anyone think it's not? Alright, so, anything else you gotta say before we wrap up the episode? It's been almost two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we really need to. I think this has gone on long enough. Alright. So I hope you all enjoyed this episode. See you guys all next time with hopefully some more topics.